Hey guys, Brian Beeler here coming to you from Storage Review and I've got alongside me Alan Malventano from Intel. How you doing? Hey, it's been a while. It has been a while. You brought us uh, a thing to play with. We've got a new super micro server in the lab uh, that Alan's brought over from all the way from Kentucky. And it looks a lot like all the other super micro servers that we've seen the last two to three years. Uh, it's Ice Lake. It's got 24 sure. bay. We've got an array of Intel and Solidime uh, SSDs uh, across the front here. Uh, it's a little bit of a, a joking matter. This one remains an Intel drive. The 5510s and 5316s are no longer. However, um, so what's what's going on here? What do you what do you have going on that you're excited about with this server? So this is one of the systems I use for testing, and I just figured uh, there's another system that we're going to cover in a separate video uh, that was really the, the the meat of why I came. But I figured, well, if I'm going to drive out there, I might as well throw this in the car. It's a uh, solid 32 minutes. Thanks for. Uh, well, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, it's one of the systems I do for my own uh, storage testing mm -hmm. and and sort of pathfinding and on the Intel side and. Uh, so that'll be interesting to look at because it's one of the like most fully loaded uh, configurations you could do for this particular supermicro system. Okay, well, okay, yes, it's fully loaded. We'll tilt it on the side and show you all the pieces inside. Yep. Across the front, though, this is where it's interesting because NVMe has given system vendors a lot of challenges and fits in terms of how do they present a bunch of NVMe drives across the front of these that are hot swappable, U.2 or mm -hmm. even U1S or anything else for that matter. That the form factor doesn't really matter. Uh, but we've normally been seeing these types of configurations, a 2U standard uh, dual proc system from Intel with 8 to maybe 12 or 16 NVMe drives. So what's in this one? So typically if you, like Supermicro does make systems that have higher even than 12 or 16 uh, front panel U.2, front panel available or testable U.2s. Usually the catch is that they're going through some kind of a switch to get there, mm -hmm. right? So. Uh, Yes, you do have you know up to twenty four devices, or they even make systems that have you know that extra. I forget the name of it, but there's one where you rack it out and right. another module. I, tells I like to call that the rocket launcher. Yeah, yeah, the little rocket launcher comes up, and there's another twenty four bays mm -hmm. in there. But you can't get full bandwidth to all of those drives simultaneously just because there's there's these switches involved, and you're only using X number of lanes when you get to the processor side of the equation. Right. Uh, this system is unique in that it doesn't do all twenty four, but twenty two out of the twenty four front panels are one-to-one, -one, no switches involved. They are all going to lanes on these ice-like processors in okay. the system. So we've got two, let's see, my first two are the SATA SAS, and right. then it'll go up to 12 SATA SAS, right? Yes. But uh, bays, whatever it would be, one through, uh, or two through 12, then could also be NVMe. Two through? All the way to the end. All the way to the end. Yeah. Right. So you have 22, so it's, it's 88 lanes of Gen 4, PCI going to this front panel. So let's talk about the lanes a little bit because lane affinity has been something that comes up from time to time in terms of which CPU is doing which task. Mm -hmm. And the lanes obviously are evenly split between the CPUs, but where the lanes go is not necessarily. Sometimes storage will get more on CPU zero and one might not have half, but might have extra ports off the, or, uh, 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 connections off the riser for those lanes. So, right. what what do we think about uh, lane affinity, for lack of a better? Term? I mean, I mean, you just have, you do have to consider that when you're specking out these systems as far as which drives you're putting where and knowing. Okay, you know, you have to sort of map out which you know which connectors go to which port, physical uh, connector on the motherboard, or which retimer card in the back, which in turn goes to which CPU. So you have to, you know, you do have to consider that. Uh, if your work, especially if your workload is that sensitive and that that latency sensitive, that you don't like your data running across, you know, the bus between both processors, right? Okay. Um, so yes, it's something you have to consider for performance uh, reasons, but it's a solvable problem. You just, you know, sort of take notes as you do the build. Okay. And so this system's full of persistent memory too, so we can talk about that a little bit. Yep. We've got the Optane SSD, we've got the TLC standard issue 5510 SSDs, and then yep. we've got the QLC 5316 high capacity uh, SSDs. So there's all, we we're actually have almost, we have everything right. in, the, in the hierarchy from DRAM CPU to DRAM to PMEM to Optane mm -hmm. SSD to TLC SSD to QLC SSD. Right. And when you combine these things into one system with intelligent design, you can actually do a lot. 
Yeah, this, uh, is, this is almost all the tiers of the pyramid. It, it is, yeah. Sitting, well, we're missing the hard drives, but right. we could slam them on a JBOD off the back if we wanted to. Right, exactly. So you could have, you know, the as you get you know smaller and faster, just all the way up the stack. Yeah. Right. Uh, so you could potentially have, you know, hundreds of terabytes of of NAND sitting in the front here that you can that you can access, you know, relatively quickly. Not worried about switches, so you can get maximum uh, throughput. Uh, at, at full, you know, bus saturating bandwidth for those drives into the PMEM, say, if you needed to do that, right? If you just, you know, okay, I have a workload or a huge data set, too much data to even fit in, even though the server has a four terabytes of PMEM, which is pretty impressive. But again, one of those drives is 30 terabytes. Right. So, you know, there's clearly there's differences in the ability to just store way more data on a smaller device, just, you know, hanging off a different bus, right? Um, but you could potentially just pull in you know, four terabytes at a go, roll it over the PMEM, do whatever work you need to do with it more quickly uh, and still in a persistent manner. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, potentially take whatever that output is of that workload, you know. Kick it out, grab it out for four and keep going. Out. Yeah, you could potentially do things like that. It all depends on the workload. Well, that's the that's the really great thing about platforms like this is the infinite flexibility. And so what Supermicro did is they took their, their existing Ice Lake server and then uh, provided this kit and so we'll flip it over and take a look at that uh, here in a second yeah. so that you can see kind of the cabling and the the uh, cards and retimers that are being used here uh, when we think about some of the data analytics stuff that's going on and you started to hit on it in in terms of in-memory uh, processing of data mm -hmm. we're seeing something happening where a lot of data is being collected at the edge mm -hmm. but then we start having a lot of data transport issues in terms of how do you get it back to a system like this for analytics, and I guess that's what you're saying is, with that data pyramid and being smart in the way you're designing these systems, you can keep more data with these bigger QLC drives really close to where your intensive processing can be, right? and then eventually tearing it down to hard drive or whatever else you need to when you're done with the analytics. Yeah, and you could potentially still have, like you said, hard drives hanging off of, a, you know, you could have a, a SAS card in here and just directly address a bunch of drives in another, you know, for you or something, sitting somewhere else in the rack, if you really needed to, or somewhere, you know, NAS on the network, just depends on what your use case was and, and, and purpose was. But yeah, just the, the more of the pyramid you can get in one box, though, that's potentially going to give you, you know, much more flexibility and, and just the thing. A tremendous flexibility. So right. what are you finding on the software side? Because that's another one of the challenges, right, is that uh, we can put all this stuff in here, mm -hmm. but now, how do we effectively use it? And and I guess maybe think about it from two different angles. One from, you know, the HPC guys that are running Linux in their own stacks. They they figured that out years ago, and that's not really a problem. Right. In the enterprise, maybe a little bit bigger challenge. If you go into, you know, you wouldn't use this in analytics box necessarily in a virtualized world, but mm -hmm. that's still the 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 bulk of the industry. What do you think about software? A lot of. Even even the hardware is still evolving, right? Realize this is only the second generation of, of PMEM that we've done. Yeah, the right? 200 series. 200 which series, is the... which is what's in here, which which couples with Ice Lake. Um, but you know, we had Cascade Lake with 100 series, and there's even changes that have happened where, you know, uh, Cascade Lake PMEM, like 100 series PMEM, was actually a little bit more flexible, hardware configuration wise, than even those 200 series is. And that's come from the fact that like we had to put the 100 series out there, see how people would actually use it, mm -hmm. and then take that feedback and turn it around into okay. So one example, the 100 series would do uh, mixed mode, so you can have app direct yep. and memory mode, and you could do both, mm -hmm. right? You could say I want 50% uh, of it for this, the other 50% for that. As it turned out, you know that resulted in did nobody do that? A nobody did it. <laughs> Uh, B, even if they did do it, it was less than optimal performance-wise, right? Because you're trying to, there's contention, memory Too mode much, right. is trying to, yeah. you know, swap data out like in cache style. Uh, but at the same time, you have some AppDirect process trying to also talk to the PMM. And so just too many things trying to hit it at once and just sort of, you'd get to the point where you could actually saturate like the, the DRAM bus itself, right? Okay. There's just too much stuff trying to talk on the bus. The PMM can't talk as fast as the DRAM. You really want to optimize when and how you're talking to the PMEM and sort of interleave that correctly with the DRAM access, right? Because again, they're sharing. Um, so yeah, the 100 series could do that that mixed mode. This they just did away with it because yeah, again, nobody was using it. So so we actually have you know hardware changes, design changes taking place in sort of the evolution of the PMEM itself. That's on the hardware side. 
And then, yes, there's still all of the software stuff that still right. needs to happen, still developing. Um, but again, it's very much that chicken and the egg problem, right? You have to you have to make the thing first. You know, the technology that didn't even exist not too many years ago. Um, yeah. That I frequently say that, like, if if persistent memory technology like this had come about, say, 20 years ago, we wouldn't even be having this discussion. Like, it would be, you know, probably, oh, here's this system that just, it's like a foregone conclusion that it just has PMAM or potentially just, just even part of it. Yeah. yeah. Just, it's just like a part of the machine. Like just, it, it could just be like a, you know, a desktop system that we're looking at that potentially would just have the same thing. And Oh yeah. Windows just sits on the PMAM and just boots just, right into yeah, it. Just sees right. it. Just knows what, what to do. Right. Just knows what to do, but we're, we're not there. That, well, no, I mean, this you know, is always the industry challenge with any new technology, right? Is right. that when new NAND comes out, new form factors, new, whatever that the industry has to, uh, has to adapt. And PMAM has spun up like, a series of new startups just just around how do we accelerate these workloads? How do we take right. databases that traditionally run in memory and expand that footprint and make it uh, persistent, the, the, the whole P part, so that if we have an unplanned power outage or need to cycle the system or whatever, that there's a real challenge in rehydrating that data. Mm -hmm. And even though it's on the DRAM bus, when you start talking four, six, eight terabytes of data, it's not nothing right. to pull that off of the, the storage, even if it's fast SSDs, and rehydrate that, fire up your your uh, your database and get going again. Right. Um, we talked about especially if it was a database that was very active at the time the power went out and you have like intent logs and other things that, mm -hmm. you know, sort of, you, it's not just a matter of, oh, I will just copy this four terabytes back over sequentially. It might not even be that, right? It might it might take way longer than you would expect, right? Because don't get me wrong, this this amount of PMEM and each one of those DIMMs will do eight uh, gig per second a piece. Mm -hmm. So you would think, oh yeah, just that should be like a few seconds. I'll just have that thing. Right. No, that's not the case. It's not. It's very much right. not. So that's why companies like Memverge exist and others uh, that, that are out there trying to take these systems, especially these multi-tier systems, mm -hmm. put software around it, some intelligence around it, and make it happen. Let's flip this guy over so we can take a look at the, uh, the inside. All right, the big lift. It should just sit. Yeah, I'm still going to put an arm behind it. Just <laughs> yeah. for you, you be the pointer and I'll be the holder. Uh, so, again, from the, the drive plane, mm -hmm. things start to look pretty similar, but now we've got a ton of uh, more connectors and cabling in the system. Right, so the, get the easy one out of the way first. So you've got these four, uh, you know, four channels a piece SATA slash SAS connectors, right? And then they just route around and then they plug into the board back here. Okay. Uh, so that's that's pretty simple. Those are the, and that's probably going to be present on any possible configuration of the system, right? I think they just wire those in and I don't even think it's really a, an option to not have that, right? right? Um, but then where it gets spicy is all of these slim SAS connectors, which are not carrying SAS, they're carrying Gen 4 PCI. And the, it's kind of a mess to be able to even figure out which one goes where since they have put so many in right. this configuration. But there are a series of headers on the front of the board there where you can see what looks like smaller connectors and there's actually pairs of them. So each one of those connectors is four lanes. Each one of these bigger slim SAS connectors over here is eight lanes, right? So that you basically have a cable that just splits one to two. Okay. Um, so each pair of those goes to one of these, which in turn drives two of the drives, right? Um, and so you've got four pair here. There's another one of the larger single slim SAS connectors also on the board there. So that's giving you a bunch of lanes already, but that wasn't nearly enough, right? Because that would only, that's only enough to, to run uh, 10 drives. So to get the additional 12, uh, you have four drives off of each one of these retimer cards, of which there are three. Okay, so that's your that's your 12 to get to 22. Yes. Okay. And that gives you the 88 lanes total. And you still have, you know, that doesn't suck up everything that's available. Uh, you still have, uh, I think for this config, it works out to... Uh, eight, 16, I think there's 32 more lanes up here okay. in, this, in this port. So, uh, and it's, it's four slots total, so you could potentially have like a two slot GPU and then, you know, a couple of NICs or something like that, or NIC and uh, SAS control, external SAS controller. And you've you got 8380s in this guy? Uh, no, they're 8368Qs. 8368Q, okay. Two less cores. Okay. Uh, 300 megahertz higher clock. Ah, all right. Um, it's... 
And it's, I don't, I'm not sure if you're supposed to be able to legitimately spec the system with those CPUs, but I work for the company, so I just, <laughs> this may not be standard. This issue. is not a standard config. Yeah. Uh, it's, it still works just fine, but I think that's, that skew of CPU is meant to be water cooled. And this is not a water cooled chassis, but they still do work. It's, the, it's doing okay though. It, it does okay. The fans, you know, the, your neighbor might think that the fire engine is sitting in front of your house because the fans are spun up all the way, but you know, yeah, it does, it does work. It's uh, better for, uh, you know, the type of testing I do, I needed higher clocks. Right. So I needed, it, I didn't really care which skew it was, I just needed a higher turbo boost than most of the other ice like line had, and that just happened to be the part that had it. All right, so in the system, we're gonna get two ice like CPUs, two SATA drives, mm -hmm. up to 22 NVMe drives. Mm -hmm. We've got PMEM 200 series throughout, and still a, uh, a riser in the back that'll let us have high speed, yeah, maybe you want to throw a 100 gig card in, 200 gig, okay. whatever, to get your IO in and out of this thing. Yeah. As we talk, maybe a, uh, a SAS adapter, throw a hard drive JBOT on there. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of options. So while most of the lanes have been driven to the front of the system, there's still enough there to give you some expansion yep. to remain with the flexibility on the IO. Yeah. All right. It's a pretty cool config. It is a cool config. Thanks for bringing it over. Yeah. Figured it was worth showing off. There you go. Thanks for tuning in.